Your light now. Should I share my screen now? Yeah, I can share your screen. Uh, we'll wait for some few more minutes so that yeah. more people can join in. Yeah, once you once you are ready, let me know. I'll share my screen that time. Okay. Gotcha. So audience can post their um, questions in the comment box below. I'll be moderating it at the end of the presentation. I think you can share your screen. Sure. Okay, uh, let me know when to start talking because I yep. really can't see anyone. So, uh, I'll let you. Sure. You can see the screen, right? Again, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I think I'll start. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the second chapter of Bio Battalion webinar series. Today, we are extremely delighted to host Dr. Adar Saran, Research Associate Professor, Loyola University, Chicago. But before we begin with the presentation, I would like to talk a few words about Bio Battalion. We are a relatively nascent not-for-profit group started by a group of like-minded science students at the early phase of their career in science. We try to organize webinars on a perpetual basis and work closely with academicians, industrial researchers, and science communicators. We are also inviting original creations from interested people to freely host on our Bio Battalion science blogs. This initiative, we believe, would eventually help them become better science communicators. Also, if you haven't already subscribed to YouTube channel, please do so to receive instant notifications on our upcoming events. Also, as I told, um, audience can post their questions in the comment box, and I'll be moderating at the, at the, end, of the end of the presentation. Um, now, without further delay, let me introduce Dr. Adarsh Dharan to you all. Dr. Adarsh Dharan is a trained cell biologist and virologist, currently working at the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at Loyola University, Chicago, USA, as a research associate professor. Dr. Dharan obtained a Bachelor of Technology degree in biotechnology and biomedical engineering in July 2008 from the University of Kerala, India, and a master's degree in genetic manipulation and molecular cell biology in January 2010 from the University of Sussex, the United Kingdom. Dr. Dharan enrolled in the Infectious Biology PhD program at Hanover Medical School, Germany, where his thesis was an understanding how microtubules and its associated motors aided HCV replication and in the formation of HCV-induced replication factories. Upon completing his PhD, Dr. Darren moved to Loyola University, Chicago to start his postdoctoral training under the guidance of Professor Edward Campbell. At Loyola, Dr. Darren's primary focus was to better characterize the early stages of HIV-1 replication with focus on viral trafficking and nuclear import. In 2019, Dr. Darren was promoted to his current position his research is primarily funded through the National Institute of Health Grants. Apart from his research duties, Dr. Dharan is also involved in mentoring students in their research projects, teaching two courses for masters and PhD students in the department. Now over to you, Dr. Adar Uh Thank you, Pooja. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. So, uh, so today uh, I'm actually going to talk to you about uh, one of the 
uh, steps which is involved in during the HIV-1 life cycle, which is the nuclear input of the virus. So uh, as Pooja mentioned, uh, I'm right, currently I'm a research associate professor uh, with Loyola University and uh, I'm we are in this. Uh, we are in this building, which is called the Center for uh, Translational Research and Education. So it is. It's a. It's a big multidisciplinary institute where you know microbiology is just uh, one part of it. There's. It's. It, it comprises of a number of uh, institutes, and uh, I'm, I'm basically, like I said, I'm in the microbiology department. So one of my research focus is, uh, like Pooja mentioned, uh, is to better understand how uh, HIV one uh, infects a cell. So as uh, most of you are aware of, uh, HIV-1 is the virus that causes AIDS. So, um, and uh, what happens so like once the virus infects is it results in a gradual uh, or a drastic decrease in your uh, CD4 positive T cells. Or, and what happens is like once the person acquires the virus or once the person acquires uh, AIDS, you uh, are mostly immunocompromised. So, um, and as you can see from this uh, most uh, recent update from uh, the WHO, around 38 million, 38 million people are living with uh, the virus right now. And so that brings the importance of why, you know, we need to better understand this virus and uh, to make more uh, suitable drug targets. So uh, um, now coming on to a more cell bi uh, biological, a more cell biology into the virus. So HIV-1, it's a positive strand, a single stranded positive sensor. RNA virus. So you have actually the RNA virus, which is basically the genetic material for the for the virus, which is mostly enclosed within this uh, conical structure, which is made up of a protein called P24. So this uh, conical structure basically houses the viral RNA. We have two copies of the viral RNA, along with a number of other proteins which the virus requires. And some of them are the reverse transcriptase. So uh, one of the hallmark of HIV-1 is like it, which makes it different from other viruses. Like for example, like, you know, everyone right now should be familiar with SARS-CoV-2, right? So it's an RNA virus. So HIV-1 is also an RNA virus, but what makes it different is it's able to convert its RNA virus into a DNA, which can then integrate into our host chromosome. And how the virus does is the virus has a enzyme called the virus reverse transcriptase, which converts the RNA into DNA. And then it has the integrase protein, which integrates the reverse transcribed uh, DNA into the host chromosome. So all this uh, components along with the viral RNA, it's uh, enclosed within this uh, conical capsid structure. So the conical capsid has a number of uh, 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 significance. So it basically, it's, it's like a shell which protects everything within uh, this structure from uh, our host, uh, our from our host body so like like most of you are aware of like our host has a number of defense mechanisms which which protects us from many different pathogens right and so uh this structure basically it's kind of like a shell which protects everything within the structure from any host mechanism now uh surrounding this uh, viral caps that you have the viral matrix protein and outside the matrix protein you have a lipid bilayer which the virus uh gets from the host cell and onto this lipid bilayer are the viral glycoproteins which the virus uses sorry, to... sir. Yeah. excuse me sorry. so um are you changing the slides sir um actually... no I'm, I'm 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 not changing the slides all right all right yeah. thank you sorry you you can see you can see you can see my pointer right yeah 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 okay i'm not changing the slides so uh, yeah, onto this uh, viral, uh, onto this lipid bilayer, you have the viral glycoproteins, which the virus uses to uh, gain entry into the cell. So now, uh, uh, just to give you a little bit more uh, depth into the viral life cycle before we actually move uh, into the uh, into the talk. So uh, like I said, uh, the once the virus finds its target cell, and in case of HIV, one it's mostly the CD4 positive T cells or the dendritic cells. The virus uh, binds to its receptor, which is the CD4, along with the core receptors, the CCR5 or the CXCR4. And once the glycoproteins bind to these receptors, there's a structural change happening at the glycoprotein level. And this structural change actually results uh, in the viral, viral membrane actually fusing with the plasma membrane. And once it fuses, it releases this uh, conical capsid, which has all the viral RNA and all the accessory proteins into the cytoplasm. And once the viral capsid is in the cytoplasm, it traffics from the site of entry all the way down to the nucleus. And during this process, uh, like I said, the viral RNA gets was transcribed into DNA. And once it's inside the nucleus, the DNA is integrated uh, into, the, into our host chromosome. 
So what the virus uh, uses is the, our own host translation machinery to make more copies, right? And once it makes more copies, it then exits out from the nucleus and then goes over to the plasma membrane where the virus assembles and then the newly assembled viral, viral particles are then released, which then goes ahead to infect more cells. So this is, uh, this is a very uh, general overview of how the virus life cycle works. But so my aim today is actually to show you like all the steps of the viral life cycle. I mean, I mean, what we have contributed to, you know, better understand the steps of the viral life cycle. So uh, there's a number of uh, host factors as well as restriction factors, uh, uh, you know, which plays a critical role during the virus infection. So when I say host factors, those are factors which the virus needs to infect a cell, right? I mean, the virus carries some of them, like it has its own proteins, but it also needs some host for proteins, like proteins within our cell uh, to help in uh, its replication. But in the, if you look into the, you know, the, in, in, into the other side, there are restrictions factors. So our body is trying to always, you know, defend this infection. So there are restriction factors which tries, tries to uh, which tries to prevent the uh, virus infection. And one of the reasons the virus uh, recruits a number of host factors is to evade these restriction factors. So for example, uh, what I can show you here is like, you know, in this cartoon, you can see like A, it's a normal virus infection. A virus gets in, it recruits a number of host factors. It goes all the way to the uh, nucleus, gets into the nucleus. Uh, it has its uh, uh, infection happening, right? But let's say you have a defective virus, a virus which is not able to re recruit host factors. It gets actually sensed by our host mechanism. And, you know, it, this can prevent infection. And similarly, you know, like I said, there are restriction factors which binds to the viral capsid or the, you know, the conical structure. And it can actually degrade the viral capsid and thus it prevents infection. So uh, for one example, uh, the virus recruits a host factor called cyclophilin A. And the reason, and you know, uh, there has been a number of studies going on in the last several years, but recently what they have found is uh, the reason the virus recruits cyclophilin A is our, our, our body has a protein called trim 5 alpha. So trim 5 alpha can actually bind to the virus capsid and degrade the capsid. Thus, it prevents mm -hmm. infection. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Actually, uh, this slide is still still in the. I mean, it's actually the first slide still now. It has not been changed yet. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, you don't. So it's still in the first slide right now. Yeah, yeah. Wait. Uh, sorry. I'm I'm so sorry. Uh, wait. Let me actually stop sharing. Uh, so you, you don't see the slides now, right? No. Okay, let me share the screen. Yeah. Uh, wait, where's... Yeah, I'm not so familiar with StreamYard, how it works. Uh, okay, let's see. Let's see if this works. I, 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 okay, now I can't really find my slides now. Okay, it's opening up the presentation. Uh, okay. Uh, so do you, do you see the slides now? Um, not yet, sir. Yeah, we can see. Okay, you, you. So I'm making it full screen right now. All right. Now you see it as full screen. You do or you you don't? No, not yet. Oh, so there must be a lag. I mean, okay. Um, can you try changing the slides? Like. Uh, so you see yeah. the slides moving right? Now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, now it's. Yeah, now so yes, you see, this, but do you see the slides on the side, or you just see the? Uh, we, it's not in the full screen mode. Uh, we can see the slides on the side. Okay, so I, okay, <laughs> that means should I go in this way then? Yeah, 
This will be fine. Like, uh, but the slides are moving. So. Okay. Okay. Uh, then I, you know, I'll go, I'll go it in. I'll go in this way. That's fine. But, you know, this okay. is the way it has to be. Okay. I'm sorry. So, uh, uh, so if you were really stuck on the first slide, uh, um, okay. Let let me get back to this point. I think that kind of clarifies most of the situation here. Okay. So uh, what I was saying is like, you know, once uh, the virus infects a cell. Uh, it recruits a number of host factors uh, to, you know, to successfully uh, complete uh, the, uh, you know, the process of infection. So, um, uh, so one ex example I was talking about is the factor called the host factor called the cyclophilin A. So the reason uh, the virus recruits cyclophilin A is uh, our our body has a protein called trim five alpha. So trim five alpha can actually bind to the virus capsid and then degrade the capsid so it can act, it prevents infection. So what the virus Virus does is it recruits cyclophilin A, which prevents trim 5 alpha from binding to the capsid. So the take-home message here is like, you know, there is a there is a number of host factor recruitment which the virus does to uh, successfully, you know, uh, uh, complete uh, the process of infection and to evade our host uh, sensing mechanism. And uh, this becomes more clear actually in the next slide. So, you know, this is just three publications, but you know, there's like a there's like a ton of publications right now. So any any kind of abnormality in the viral events, like you know the the virus, uh, the traffic, in the all the stages of the virus cycle is perfectly timed. It has to be done in the right sequence. So any abnormality you have in these viral events can actually stimulate our host sensing mechanism. So for example, you know this paper, which is from Greg Tao's lab at uh, UCL London, what they have shown is like you know if you deplete certain host factors, which the virus requires, it will actually result in the virus getting sensed by our uh, host body, and then the virus actually being degraded by our host body. So this host factor recruitment is like very critical for the virus for uh, a successful infection. And, uh, uh, and our lab, what we have shown is the trafficking event. So like I said, once the virus binds uh, or once the virus enters, it needs to traffic from the site of entry to the nucleus, and if we prevent this trafficking, like you, or if we actually strand the virus in the cytoplasm, this will actually result in the virus being sensed by our host, and then um, the virus being degraded by our host. So again, the the take-home message here is like all the steps which I talked about in the early stages of the virus infection is perfectly timed, or it has to be done in the right orientation. Otherwise, that can actually result in our host body being uh, recognizing the virus and uh, triggering a uh, uh, response. So this makes it more interesting why we need to understand every step of the virus life cycle, because if you understand every step of the virus life cycle, it's more easier to find ways how we can actually uh, modulate those steps so our host body can actually sense the virus and then you know uh, prevent infection. So like I said in my, uh, in, so my talk, what I'm interested in is how the virus um, uh, accomplish the process of nuclear import. So like I said, once the virus enters the cell, it traffics all the way down to the nucleus. So once at the nucleus, the virus has to enter the nucleus, right? And what it does is it travels through the nuclear pore complex. So I'm not sure how many of you, um, I think I, I think most of you must have heard of the nuclear pore complex. So the nuclear pore complexes are giant macromolecular structures, which are made up of more than 30 different uh, proteins. So these proteins are arranged, like there are multiple copies of the same protein within a nuclear pore complex. And these nuclear pore complexes are like a gatekeepers. They are like the gateways into the nucleus. So uh, proteins or certain molecules which are below a certain size limit can freely diffuse through these nuclear pore complexes. But proteins above a certain size, they once they have a nuclear transport receptors, they can be actively transported through the nuclear pore complexes. So what I'm interested in, and, and it has been shown that the virus capsid uses the nuclear pore complexes to gain entry into the nucleus. So what I'm interested in is like, what are the factors? Like how does the virus accomplish this process of nuclear import? Like what are the factors that helps the virus to complete this process? And if we can actually find those factors, you know, there is, there, there is a chance that we can affect this uh, process and then thus inhibit the virus infection. So, um, when I started my work with uh, Dr. Campbell in uh, 2013, I mean, the, the first kind of project we were really working on was uh, the trafficking events. Like uh, once the virus enters, how does it traffic along microtubules? So, I mean, shown here, it's a, a VPR. VPR is one of the accessory protein of the virus labeled with the GFP. 
and you can see the uh, the VPR labeled virus particles on microtubules. So what uh, I was interested in is like what are the factors that helps the virus to traffic along microtubules and um, we were basically interested in these two um, microtubule motors, kinesin and dynein. I'm pretty sure you must have uh, heard about this one in your uh, cell biology uh, classes. And um, uh, the first uh, kind of paper I had from uh, from Dr. Campbell's lab was we looked at how viral uncoating, uh, which I will talk in more detail in my later part of the talk. Uh, uh, we showed how uncoating is actually facilitated by these two motor proteins. Uh, so when we were actually studying this, uh, uh, when we were actually doing this process, what we kind of noticed for one of the kinesin uh, protein was uh, was quite interesting. So when we knocked down kinesin one, uh, kif 5 b which is a kinesin one motor domain uh, using SARNA. So SARNA, you can actually, uh, you know, it's not a knockout; it's a knockdown of your protein. And uh, uh, a nuc three fifty eight, which is a uh, which is a protein which is uh, present in the nuclear pore complex. So what we saw was, uh, if you look at the infectivity, you're looking at the wild type infection. This is scrambled SARNA. When you knock down kif 5 b or nuc three fifty eight, you see a drastic reduction in infection. And when we look at the virus reverse transcription, so we can measure reverse transcription or the nuclear import using specific primers. So when we looked at reverse transcription, there was no change in reverse transcription. So the virus is able to convert its RNA into DNA. But, but when we looked at the nuclear import, this decrease in infection correlated to a defective nuclear import. So somehow the virus is not able to get into the nucleus when you deplete out kinesin-1 or the kinesin-1 motor domain or nuc 358 and uh, when we looked at the virus by microscopy, so what we did here was uh, we took HeLa cells, uh, a, a normal cell which most people use uh, in the in the in the virus field, and we infected these cells with uh, HIV one. And after three hours post infection, we we fixed the cells and we stained the cells for the virus capsid protein P24 using an antibody. And what you can see here is in the control, you see the that the virus is like all all the way in, in the cytoplasm. But when we knocked on kinesin 1 or nu 358, you can actually see the virus is stuck around the nucleus. It's as if like it's not able to get into the nucleus. And we could quantify this one. Like, you know, we could quantify this red signal. And what you can see here is like if you concentrate just on the three hour time point, either for the KIF 5B uh, knockdown or for the nu 350, you can see compared to the control, there is like an increased virus around the in the, in the perinuclear location. So what it shows is like somehow when you when you knock down this uh, kinesin one or nuc three fifty eight it results in the virus from like it results uh, it it results in the virus being stranded at the nucleus and not being able to get into the nucleus. And we also saw a different uh, we also saw an, uh, a different phenotype with uh, with the nuc three fifty eight. So if you look at uninfected cell, like I said, nuc 358, it's a, it's a it's a member of the nuclear pore complex. So if you look at if you stay in a normal cell, it will be you know right around the nucleus. But what happens after a virus infection? So this is infecting with the wild type uh, HIV1 virus. Either in uh, it's two different cell lines. It's either monocyte derived macrophages or HeLa cells. What you can see here is like there is a drastic relocalization of this protein into the cytoplasm when you're comparing it with an uninfected cell. And um, you lose that phenotype. You lose the phenotype which I show, which uh, which you have seen before when you knocked on kinesin one. So when you knocked on kinesin one again, you see all the viruses stuck around the nucleus, and you prevent this nuc three fifty eight from being relocalized into the cytoplasm. And this is also like you know we quantified this phenotype, you can, and you can see here the amount of nuc three fifty eight in the cytoplasm. Like if you look at the three hour time point compared to the control, when you knocked on kinesin 1, there is a drastic decrease in the amount of nu 358 in the cytoplasm. So at that time, we actually put forward a, a, a model where both kinesin 1 and nu 358, how it mediates the nuclear import of the virus. So what we thought at that point, what was happening is the virus, once it enters, it comes all the way down to the nucleus, right? Now, the nuclear pore has a size limitation, right? And the virus is too large for the, uh, you know, to pass through the nuclear pore complex. So what the virus we think is happening is um, once it's at the nuclear pore complex, it actually gets inserted into the nuclear pore complex. And then kinesin one, 
So kinesin 1, it's a, it's a motor protein which moves towards the plasma membrane. So it binds onto the virus capsid, and then it pulls the virus capsid in the other direction, means towards the plasma membrane. And by pulling the virus capsid towards the plasma membrane, it's actually breaking out the virus capsid. It's actually like reshaping the virus capsid to a size which can pass actually through the nuclear power complex, right? So um, I hope, I think, you, I, I, I'm assuming you got that uh, thing. So, um, and this is, this, I mean, we were not the first people to actually put forward such a, such a mechanism. I mean, um, uh, this has been proposed by a different group in 2011 for a different virus, for adenovirus. So what they see a similar phenotype. So adenovirus, it's a, it's a huge virus, right? It, and once it comes to the nuclear pore complex, it can't really pass through the nuclear pore complex. So what happens is a similar mechanism where kinesin comes and binds and it pulls the virus capsid in the opposite direction, thereby you know, breaking out the virus capsid. And what happens is whatever is inside the genetic material inside the virus capsid is then transported through the nuclear pore complex. So uh, we were like, oh, Okay, this is this is this is pretty interesting. We see a similar phenotype with HIV. We see a similar phenotype with adenovirus. That means something is happening. So somehow these viruses are able to utilize a mechanism which is which our host body has. Like as probably most of you are aware of, like you know, viruses doesn't invent anything new. They actually hijack our host mechanism, right? They utilize whatever is present in our host body to for its own benefits. So we thought, okay, maybe maybe we we came up with an hypothesis saying, okay, maybe HIV and maybe adenovirus, it's hijacking a host repair mechanism whereby if there is a huge thing which is sitting right at the nuclear pore complex, then it's recruiting kinesin one to actually remove this block, and the virus is hijacking this mechanism to gain entry into the nucleus, and we wanted a way to somehow you know study this mechanism. So, I, but you know, for today's talk, I won't be really going into this hypothesis. This is a completely cell biological question, which uh, you know we are pursuing. But uh, to do that, actually, we were looking for you know systems which you know by which you can study this process. So uh, during that time, we came around this paper uh, from a different lab at University of Michigan uh, in, in in the U.S. So what they did is uh, they used a, a nuclear pore protein called NUP62. So NUP62, what they did was they fused the NUP62 onto a dimerization domain along with a few copies of GFP, which is a fluorescent protein. And what they did was you can express this construct into any cell types. So once you express this construct, NUP62 goes to the nuclear pore complex because it, it belong, it's a nuclear pore protein, right? So it goes and sits at the nuclear pore complex. Now, what you can do is, since it has a dimerization domain, you can add a drug, which I'm calling here as a homodimerizing drug, right? Once you add the drug, it dimerizes all those, all these domains, the DMRB domains. So once it dimerizes all these domains, so the NUP62 has to be quite flexible in the central channel for, you know, things to pass uh, inside and outside. But if you dimerize all the NUP62 right at the central channel, it prevents active transport. So they use this construct to basically block active nuclear pore transport. And so we were like, okay, this is this is pretty cool. Like we can use this construct to study our hypothesis. We can clog nuclear pore complexes and ask if kinesin is actually required to repair this clogged pore. And this would really support our you know virus mechanism that you know the virus is utilizing a mechanism which the cell has you know uh, to gain entry into the nucleus. Now. Uh, uh, the figure here basically shows, you know, the system works uh, uh, like, you know, estrogen receptor actually is uh, basically it's in the um, it's in the uh, uh, cytoplasm. And if you add the estradiol, which is the, which is the hormone, the estrogen can like, you know, translocate into the uh, nucleus. But once you block the nuclear pore complex using this technique, you no longer prevent the estrogen translocation and when you add the hormone. So this, this is a proof of principle to show that, you know, the system works to block uh, nuclear pore transport. Now, uh, so I was like, we were like super excited. We were like, okay, we're going to study the cell biology process. And we were like, you know, me and Dr. Campbell were, you know, talking over this one. And we were like, okay, what happens? Like, what happens if you use this blockade? What happens to virus infection, right? Uh, this virus infection goes down. 
So what we did was we made a number of cell lines. So this is HeLa cells, THP1 cell and a number of different T cell lines. We expressed all these cell lines with our construct. And what, what we did was we infected all these cell lines uh, with the virus, with the HIV1 virus. And we blocked the nuclear pore complex. We added the drug to block the nuclear pore complex. And what we saw was when we added the drug, there was a drastic decrease. You can see here, uh, if you compare this blue and the, and the red bars here, you can see there's a drastic decrease in infection, regardless of what cell type you're doing. When you, add, when you block the nuclear pore complexes, you block infection. And this block in infection is actually at the level of nuclear import because there is no change in reverse transcription. If you look at the late RT copies, there is no change. But if you look at the two LTR circles, which is a measure for the nuclear import, you see that when you add the drug, there is a significant decrease in the amount of two LTR copies, uh, which correlates with the defective infection. So this artificial NPC blockade can in inhibit virus infection at the level of nuclear import. So we were like, okay, I mean, we kind of like, we, we put a halt onto to our cell biological question and we were like, okay, this is something we should pursue. We should, we should use this technique to, you know, now monitor nuclear import. And that's, that's what we, that's what we did. So what we did was, uh, um, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm happy to explain this essay again at the end. If you didn't understand, it's a little bit complicated essay. It's not complicated when you're doing it, but it, it's a little difficult to understand. So what we did was we took a cell line, like any cell lines which are expressing our NUP62 dimerization construct, and we infected this cell line with a reporter virus. So when I say a reporter virus, it's a virus where, you know, it, this virus is fused to mCherry. So at the end of the essay, if you see mCherry positive cells, that means it's infected with the virus. And what we did was once you infect these cells, we added the drug at different times post-infection. So you can basically consider this as a drawbridge, right? So if you look, if you think this is NPCs, when you add the drug at different time points, you're basically raising the gate. You're not allowing anything to get inside the nucleus. Uh, so we wanted to ask, when does the virus enters the nucleus, right? So let's say we add the drug at six hours post-infection and we don't see any change in infection, right? That means the virus is already inside the nucleus. So by, by adding the drug or by basically, or by basically blocking the nuclear pore at different times post-infection, you can actually see a kinetics of how uh, or when the virus actually enters the nucleus. So like I said, we added the drug at different times post-infection. Depending on whatever time we had, drug was present for the first 24 hours. And after the 24 hours, the drug was changed. Uh, the cells were kept for another 24 hours. And then we measured the amount of mCherry positive cells, which is a measure for infection by, by fax. And this is how a normal result would look like. So this is in HeLa cells. So you can see all the time points where we had the drug on the uh, x-axis. Uh, the y-axis represents the number of uh, uh, mCherry positive cells or the, the infection. So the time point zero represents the time where you add the drug immediately after you add the virus. So this is a longer time the drug is on the cell. That's why you see a greater inhibition. So this is a no drug control, right? So as you keep adding the drug at different times post-infection, you can already see that when you add the drug at 10 hours or when you basically block the nuclear pore at 10 hours post-infection, there is no significant changes in infection. That means the virus is already inside the nucleus by 10 hours, right? So this is this is basically what we're thinking. Like this is basically the idea we had was like by using this assay, we can measure the nuclear import kinetics of when the virus gains entry into the nucleus. And we can, you know, this, the graph on the, on the right, basically it's an, it's a normalized graph from here where you actually set the time point zero as uh, the baseline infection and the no drug as the hundred percent control. And then you can normalize every other time points and you can actually get a nice uh, nuclear import kinetics curve of the virus in that specific cell line. And it, as you can see in HeLa cells, it, the half time for the virus to gain entry into the nucleus is close to uh, seven hours. By, by, by around nine hours, 10 hours, the virus is already inside the nucleus. And we did the same for a number of different cell lines, for um, a number of actually relevant cell lines, I would say, like macrophages are a more relevant target cells, which the virus infects, T cells, definitely. And what we observed was 
was quite interesting in this cell line. So comparing it to HeLa cells, HeLa cells are, a, it's, it's a good model cell line, you know, to study different processes, but they are not actually the real target cells for infection, right? But if you look at this relevant cells, the half time for the nuclear input is like way faster. It's like around five hours, the virus is already inside the nucleus compared to HeLa cells. Like, like for macrophages, it's around 3.5 is the half time for T cells around the same, like by around six hours in mostly all the cell lines, the virus is already inside the nucleus. So this kind of like raised immediately a number of questions for us. Like these cell lines actually have been shown to have a very delayed reverse transcription. Like, you know, reverse transcription where, you know, the viral RNA is converted into DNA. It takes a long time in the cell lines to complete. And any classical uh, life cycle diagram if you you know Google, let, let's say you Google a HIV one life cycle diagram, they all tell you that the virus was transcription is completed in the cytoplasm before it enters into the nucleus. So we were like, no, this is not true because by by six hours the virus is already inside the nucleus, and reverse transcription cannot be completed by six hours. It's it's been shown that it takes almost twenty four hours for reverse transcription, you know, for the process to happen. So somehow all these cartoons which you have been seeing for the last uh, decade or 12 years is we are like, oh, that's wrong. I mean, it's it's not really right, right? So we, we were like, okay, we should we should be really now looking, we should be asking if reverse transcription is really completed prior to nuclear import. And also the next question we were asking is like, does the capsid actually play a role inside the nucleus? So to kind of address the first question, uh, what we did was uh, we did kind of a very similar assay, which I talked about. We took cell lines, which are expressing our new 62 dimerization construct. We infected with the virus, a reporter virus. And on the first condition, we added the drug, like the same as before. We added the homodimerizing drug to block the nuclear pores at different times post-infection. But on a second condition, what we did was we added a uh, a drug called verapin. So verapin is a HIV one. It's a very specific HIV one reverse transcriptase inhibitor. So, and uh, so what we and we added this verapin at different times post infection. Again, irrespective of what time you add, the drug was kept for the first 24 hours, and then after another 24 hours, you uh, measure infection. So what we hope to see was uh, if reverse transcription is really completed in the cytoplasm before nuclear import. So by the time the virus is already inside the nucleus, when we add the verapin, the drug which blocks reverse transcriptase, it should have no effect on infection because it's already inside the nucleus. And, and this would really support the last 12 years of the virus life cycle. But that's exactly not what we saw. So if you look into this graph here, the blue and the and the red one, that's basically, so there, there are two different cell lines. One is uh, MDMs and the other one are CD4 positive T cells, uh, which are infected with the virus. And then the blue and the red are basically, you're adding the homodimerizing drug at different times post infection. So they're basically measuring the nuclear import kinetics. And as you can see for both the cell lines, by around six hours, the virus is no longer sensitive to this block. It's all, it's, that tells you like the virus is already inside the nucleus. But if you look onto the green and the orange graph, where you add the verapin, at different times post infection, you can see that even at six hours, it's still getting inhibited. So virus infection is still affected when you add the drug, even at 10 hours, even at 12 hours. So this tells you that even though the virus is inside the nucleus, the drug is still affecting the virus infection or in a different term that the virus towards transcription is still an ongoing process. It's not completed in the nuclear, it's not completed in the cytoplasm. It's still an on, it's a, it is still an ongoing process that happens inside the nucleus of the cell. So this was like, this was literally a game changer because uh, this was like completely, you know, redrawing or re uh, drawing all the life cycle uh, diagrams, uh, you know, we see in all the textbooks. Um, and uh, we, we confirmed this also using a different assay, a more microscopy assay. So what we did here was uh, we took, we took, th we took THP1 cells, which are differentiated into macrophages. We infected with the virus and we fixed the cells at different times post-infection. So fixing means you are basically rendering the cells metabolically inactive. Uh, 
we do an RNS treatment, I think it's quite not really important at this point. So what we did was we used fish props. So these are props which are able to detect specific sequences. And these props are labeled, right? So what we did was we used fish, fish props to detect either the negative strand or the positive viral DNA strand. So once the viral RNA is converted into a DNA, you know, the DNA has a negative and a positive strand. The negative strand is the first strand that's getting synthesized, and then it's the positive strand. So we used fish props, which either dis detects the negative or the positive strand. And we also co-stained the same cells with a capsid protein and a lamin uh, using antibodies. Uh, so again, this is kind of confirming what I just told you, as you can see here is, by uh, until like six to nine hours, what you can see here is you only detect the negative strand, you don't detect the positive strand. But by around 12 hours, you start to detect the positive strand, which is a red strand all the way down to the bottom here. And even that's inside the nucleus. So the nu nuclear boundary is marked by this lamin stain. And you can see that only by around 12 hours, you start to detect the second strand of the viral DNA. And by around six, hours as you can see in the cell and nuclear import should be completed so this again like you know this is uh, quantified in this graph here that you start to detect the uh, the second strand by around 9 to 12 hours so this shows that the nuclear import precedes the completion of reverse transcription in in all the relevant cells which the virus infects now the second question uh, we wanted to ask was: uh, Does the virus capsid fully disassemble before nuclear entry? Before nuclear entry. So what is what is virus capsid disassembly? Now, if you remember the life cycle I talked about, once the virus enters a cell, you know it releases the the capsid shell into the cytoplasm, right? And the capsid shell has all the viral RNA and all the accessory proteins. Now, the viral RNA gets converted into DNA by reverse transcription. Now, at, at some stage of the virus life cycle, right, during the early stage, the capsid has to disassemble. It has to break out for the reverse transcribed DNA to get outside and integrate with our host chromosome. And so that process of, you know, breaking out the virus capsid, that's called capsid disassembly. Now, the the field of capsid disassembly, it's, it's, it's quite complicated. I mean, it has been going around for the last 12 years, like where, where does this disassembly happens? People were talking, like initially they were talking about the capsid disassembly happening right after entry, which I think most people don't regard at this point because it doesn't make sense if the capsid gets disassembled immediately because then you are, you are making your RNA to be sensed by our host uh, uh, mechanism. There's a second model where they, say is the capsid uncoats once it travels down to the nucleus like it's a gradual uncoating it slowly start to shed its shell once it travels down to the nucleus and once it's at the nucleus you completely lose the capsid and uh, whatever that's inside the capsid gets into the nucleus and then there was a third model which shows that the capsid is mostly intact which this is the this was the most preferred model until recently that the, uh, cap, the capsid remains mostly intact until it reaches the nucleus because it makes sense that you have to protect everything which is inside the capsid. And once it's at the nucleus, the, or once it's at the nuclear pore complex, the capsid disassembles and then and it, everything which is inside the capsid gets into the nucleus. And so, but like, like I said, there, there's a number of models actually for this capsid disassembly. And we were like, okay, maybe, maybe our essay could actually tell us something about the capsid disassembly process. So, uh, and this is again to show you that people have shown that there is a role of capsid inside the nucleus. Like people, they, they, can, they can detect a small amount of capsid inside the nucleus, but they were, they were having no idea of what this capsid actually plays a role inside the nucleus. So what we did was uh, we, used a, we used a compound called uh, PF74. So PF74, it's a capsid binding compound. I mean, it's right now in uh, a number of clinical trials to actually block infection. So what PF74 binds is the, so a little bit into the, into the structural biology of the virus capsid. The, the virus capsid, it's actually made up of a number of uh, hexamers and pentamers, right? So the, all the hexamers and pentamers are arranged to form this conical structure. So PF74 is actually known to bind to this hexameric structure. So the hexameric structure is only present in a in a assembled capsid, like when you have a conical capsid. So 
what we did was kind of a similar approach as the, the RT experiment. So we took cell line, which is expressing our MUP62, our dimerization construct. We infected with the virus. And after infection, we either we added either the homodimerizing drug, uh, you know, to block the nuclear pore complex, or in a second set, we added this drug at various times post infection. So what we were thinking is like, you know, if the virus is completely disassembled before nuclear import, then when you add the drug at those time points, when the virus is already inside the nucleus, it should not affect infection because this drug would only bind to an assembled form of capsid. So uh, again, uh, depending upon what time you add, the drug is kept for the first 24 hours, then and after another 24 hours, you measure infection. And what we see here is again, more interesting. Again, the blue and the red are two different cell lines where we measure the nuclear import kinetics. And again, you can see by six hours, most of the virus, it's not the, you know, it's no longer sensitive to the block. So it, the virus is already inside the nucleus. But at these time points, even when you add the drug, the PF74, which binds to an assembled form of capsid, it still inhibits infection. So that tells you that there is an assembled, like almost a fully assembled form of capsid, which is passing through the nuclear pore complex and all the way into the nucleus. So all the models which have shown where, you know, there's a gradual loss of capsid in the cytoplasm is to be frank, not true. It, there is there's, it's almost like a whole capsid is still present when the virus is all the way, like when the when the virus has finished its process of nuclear import. So just to summarize, I think I might be really on time that uh, using this assay, we were able to actually monitor the nuclear import kinetics in a number of different cell lines. And our whole point when we actually, uh, you know, developed this system was just to monitor nuclear import kinetics. We wanted to see when does the virus finish nuclear import in a number of cell lines. But you know, as like like you said, you know, when you keep doing experiments, it, it opens up more and more, uh, you know, relevant questions. And we were able to show actually that, we, like we were kind of the first lab to show that, you know, the reverse transcription is a process which is not completed in the cytoplasm and it's still an ongoing process once the virus has finished nuclear import. And also there's a presence of an assembled form of capsid inside the nucleus, which is relevant for a productive infection. And slowly I would say, the viral life cycle is changing based on all our studies and also from a different uh, also from a number of studies from other labs that you know this virus caps it like if you look at the life cycle from a from a review last year you won't see an assembled capsid in the cytoplasm but now things are changing they are kind of drawing an assembled capsid in the cytoplasm basically from our study and from other study that there is an assembled capsid even inside the nucleus and reverse transcription is still happening once the virus is, has completed the nuclear import process. So uh, with that, I would, uh, I, would, I would basically stop. I would be happy to take any questions. Uh, I mean, this is all the, uh, the people in the lab, uh, all of our collaborators, which you know, we are collaborating for constructs, for help, I mean, for experiments, uh, my funding sources, and uh, definitely Lyola uh, for the position. And uh, I'll be ha happy to take any questions. Are you guys here? Sorry, I can I can't hear you. Uh... Okay. 
Yeah, I'm here. Uh, Hello, Dr. Hello, Dr. Dennis. Can yeah, you can yeah. Hear me? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay. No. Uh, uh, shall we move to the question? Sure, sure. Go ahead. So the first question has been asked by Vaishak. Asking why are vaccines not effective against HIV as it is against other RNA viruses? I mean, it's 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 that that's because of the exactly kind of uh, one of the thing he mentioned in its in his question. It's it's an RNA virus, so there's uh, more chance. I mean, so uh, I can I can actually give you an example of from uh, our current virus. You know, the virus which we have uh, right now, the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, from from the time the virus came in in, in Jan 2020 until uh, until until yesterday. There's already four different variants, right? There's the alpha, beta, gamma, delta, right? And that's because it's an RNA virus. It rapidly mutates in the body, right? And all the mutations in SARS-CoV-2, it's linked to the spike protein. And that's the same thing with HIV-1, that there, ha there, there, there has been a number of like, so if you look at the vaccine, uh, the vaccine history for HIV-1, it has been progressing for the last 20 years. I mean, there's a number of companies which are, you know, making vaccines. But the, the problem is these vaccines work for uh, six months. And then, like, it's not even like, I mean, it's not even in market. When they do the trial, the vaccine works for six months. And then suddenly the virus just mutates. The virus adapts to the vaccine. And uh, that's that's because it's it's the most intrinsic nature of an RNA virus to mutate itself. Uh, so that, 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 that's, that's the answer why vaccines are not effective. So... The best strategy, I mean, it's easy to make vaccine, but it, it's a, it's still a long trial, you know, how to make it. But the the best approach right now people are trying is to actually inhibit infection or in, inhibit the viral load by targeting the different pathways the virus uses to infect a cell. Okay. Uh, so the next question, it's asked by Vaisha Kivishwanath. Were the drug treated cells which showed positive for infection tested for subsequent infections? Uh, were the drug treated cells, which uh, which drug are you talking? The drug, the, the, the homodimerasing drug I used? Uh, I, I, I kind of did not get that question. So if, if, if you're actually talking about the homodimerizing drug, so this, once you treat, so it's actually not a, so sorry if I, if you didn't actually get it, it's, so that drug is basically, when I say the word homodimerizing drug, it's a drug which basically blocks active transport through the nuclear pore complexes. So it actually prevents infection. So uh, we did not, so uh, all the viruses which we have been using in our study, they are single round infection. So these viruses are only able to infect the cell once because it lacks a necessary viral protein called NEF. So it can't subsequently infect a cell. But we haven't we haven't tested, you know, to see what our viruses, which which what our cells which survives the infection, can they be infected again? If that answers uh, his question. Okay. So is there any more questions? So I guess that's it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Darren. No problem. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, hosting me. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.